In this video, we're going to look at four types of reactions involving halogen compounds. The first is direct combination of the elements. We've actually seen this before in the context of hydrogen containing compounds, but we're going to revisit it again here in a second. The second is the reaction of metals with the hydrohalic acids HX, HBr, HCl, HI, etc. The third reaction type is halogen exchange, also known as metathesis, in which halogen atoms in two different compounds are exchanged for one another. Fourth reaction type we're going to look at is the dehydration of halide salts, which can be facilitated by drying agents, which often themselves contain halogens. In general, much of the reactivity of the halogens comes from either the oxidizing power of the elemental form or the Lewis acidity of the halogen atoms in compounds. The first reaction type is direct combination synthesis, and this typically involves the reaction of two atoms with an elemental halogen to form two products in which the E atoms have bonded to the X atoms. As an example of this, we can use a reaction we've seen before, the combination of elemental hydrogen with elemental chlorine to form 2HCl. You should recall from before that we thought of this as a redox process. Hydrogen, in this case, is oxidized to the oxidation state plus one, and this reaction is really driven forward by the strong oxidizing power of the elemental halogens. That is, the ability of, for example, Cl2 to accept two electrons to become Cl minus. It's the large reduction potential associated with this reaction and the resulting highly negative delta G that is the driving force for these types of reactions. The second reaction type involves the reaction of metals with the hydrohalic acids HX. A typical reaction here might involve a generic metal M, let's say an alkali metal for example, with an acid HX, two copies of that acid, to form H2 as well as the MX salt. And of course the stoichiometry of the metal and HX can vary to produce MX salts with different stoichiometry. The basic idea here is again a redox process where we think of the metal which is in the zero oxidation state, this is an elemental metal, as a reducing agent or a reductant and we can think of HX really as H plus and X minus where the H plus has the ability to act as an oxidizing agent. And if we think about how the oxidation state of H changes in this reaction, we see it goes from plus one in the reactants to zero in the products. Since H plus is really doing the business here, we can think of this as an oxidation of the metal. That means that if the resulting product salt contains, say, M plus as a cation, then the reduction potential of that cation needs to be less than zero for this reaction to go forward. And although this is a really important reaction of the hydrohalic acids, we should also notice that by and large, the halide anion acts like a spectator throughout this process. It remains essentially X minus on both the reactant and the product side. The third reaction type is known as halogen exchange, and this is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. We start on the reactant side with two species containing two different halogen atoms attached to two different groups. And these may be covalent or ionic. I'm showing them as covalent, but they may well be ionic as well. And in the products, X and X prime, the two different halogen atoms, have simply changed places. So we end up with X prime attached to the R group and X attached to the R prime group in the products. Examples of this process may involve two covalent compounds, two ionic compounds, or one covalent and one ionic compound. So for example, we can think about a halogen exchange reaction involving, for example, sodium fluoride and lithium chloride, where the two ionic salts here exchange cations forming NaCl and lithium fluoride. Whether this process goes forward or not depends to a large degree on the lattice energies of the salts involved. The side with the more stable lattices overall, the more stable crystal lattices, will be favored. The so-called Finkelstein reaction in organic chemistry involves a covalent compound like CH3Br and an ionic salt, something like sodium iodide. Here the idea is that the Br- anion that's sort of built into CH3Br, even though it's a covalent compound, can change places with the I- anion within the ionic compound NaI, 
leaving us with products CH3I now, or methyl iodide, and sodium bromide. And the position of equilibrium here is going to depend both on the relative stabilities of the covalent compounds and on the ionization energies and potentially the solubilities of the ionic compounds. The final reaction type we're going to look at is dehydration of halide salts. And in particular, we're going to look at a specific example involving a chromium hexaqua salt. So the chromium here is chromium-3, and six waters are coordinated to the chromium-3 plus cation in this salt. If we want to remove water from this salt, we can take advantage of the fact that water is nucleophilic, while many halogen-containing compounds are electrophilic. For example, we can combine this hexaqua chromium-3 salt with a drying agent, SOCl2, which is highly electrophilic. It's got a central sulfur atom surrounded by three electronegative atoms in oxygen and two chlorines. And the resulting products here are the dehydrated chromium-3 chloride, CrCl3, and then products that involve the atoms of the drying agent as well as the six waters. Specifically, we end up with six SO2 molecules and 12 HCl molecules. In fact, we can find H2O buried in these byproducts if we notice that the SOCl2 has picked up an additional oxygen atom in the products, and the 12 hydrogens in the 12 HCl account for the 12 hydrogens in the water originally. So we end up with 6O and 12H, or 6 H2O, as well as the dehydrated salt CrCl3. The electrophilic nature of SOCl2 is absolutely critical in this process. SOCl2 acts like a Lewis acid here and accepts a pair of electrons from water, generating at the same time a halide anion, and that halide anion can then pull a proton from the resulting intermediate, forming an HCl. So this is only half of the process, and there are more steps from here, but the point I want to make with this is that the ability of SOCl2 here to act as a drying or dehydrating agent depends on the fact that it's an electrophile. It reacts with nucleophilic water to pull it away from this hydrated halide salt. The water ends up sequestered permanently within byproducts, SO2 and HCl.